This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. Lex, and use code Lex at checkout to save five bucks off your order this month. That's magicspoon.com slash Lex and use code Lex. And now here's my conversation with Sagar and Jetty. There's no uh, better gifts in this world than a book about Hitler. So thank you so much. I, I've gotten the gift when I was, what were you talking yes, about? Yes, right, right. The watch from Joe Rogan, and this almost beats it. So uh, <laughs> so tell me what uh, this particular book on Hitler is. So this is volume two. Yes. So this is Ian Kershaw. He wrote the famous two volume on Hitler. I'm a big book nerd, and I spend a lot of time reading biographies. In particular, so this one, um, if you need a one volume, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, right? I think you talked about that, William yeah. Shire, because that's like Hitler's rise, Nazi Germany, the war, et cetera. But I like bios because it's the, the good biography is story of the times, right? And so this one, the first volume, it does exactly that, which is that it doesn't just tell the story of Hitler. It's the context of poor, you know, this kid in Austria and he's got all these dreams, but then actually pretty courageous in terms of World War I, right? Gets pinned to metal on by the Kaiser. And then what it's like to have to lose World War I and actually like lose this, this stain. And then the rise within, everybody knows that story, the beer hall putsch and all that. This one I like, and the reason I like Kershaw is obviously, number one, it's English, which is actually hard, right? Like in order to write that story. <laughs> inside with Chamberlain like yeah. what was it like in terms of who was this like magnetic madman who did convince the smartest people in the world at the time and you know up until like 1940 the Soviet gamble like was a he took tremendous risks but like highly calculated yeah. thinking no, no 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 I'm not gonna pay for this one I'm not gonna pay for this one and it put himself he had a remarkable ability not just to put himself in the minds of the German people, but in terms of his adversaries, like with when he was across from Mussolini. Calculate, he's like, how exactly did Mussolini, the guy who created fascism, becomes like second fiddle to Hitler? I think it's an amazing bio. And yeah, like Ian Kershaw, along with Richard Evans, two of my favorite authors on the Third Reich, no question. Do you think he was born this way, that charisma, whatever that is, or was it something he developed strategically? That's like the question you apply to some of the great leaders was he just a madman who had the instinct to be able to control people when in the room together with them or is this like he worked at it i think he worked at it and but but also there is an innate quality i'm forgetting his name his lifelong Ru rudolf ha the one who flew to berlin in like 1940 i, I forget his name. anyway so he he helped hitler write mein Kampf, and he was like slavishly yeah. Yeah. devoted to him in prison this is 1925 or something like that. And so you read that. Often think about, because we're just reading books about these people, I think about with like Jeffrey Epstein, for example. Oh, yeah. Like evil people, not evil, but people have done evil things. Let's not go to the Dan Carlin thing of what is evil. <laughs> uh, People that do evil things, I wonder what they are like in a room because I know quite a lot of intelligent people that were, uh, um, did not see, uh, did not see the evil in Jeffrey Epstein and spend time with them and not were not bothered by it. In the same sense, Hitler, it seems like he was able to get just even on a before he had power because people get intoxicated by power and yep. so on. They want to be close to power. But even before he had power, he was able to convince people. And it's unclear, like, is there something that's more than words? It's like the way you, 
I mean, the people talk, tell stories about like this piercing look and whatever, right. all that kind of stuff. I, I wonder if that, if that's somehow a part of it, like that has to be the base floor of any of these charismatic leaders. You have to be able to, in a room alone, be able to convince anybody of anything. So I can tell you from my personal experience, one of the best educated lessons I got was when I got to meet Trump. So I interviewed Trump four different times as a journalist, spent like two and a half hours with him in the Oval Office, not alone, but like me and one person and like the press secretary. And that was it. So I actually got to observe him. And as a guy who reads these types of books, right? And you know, you think of Trump, obviously most people, what they see on television, mm -hmm. you know, in articles and more, but being able to observe it like one-on-one, -on -one, I was closer to him than, you know, than I am right now from you. That was one of the most educational experiences I got because it's like you just said, the look, the, the leaning forward, the way he talks, his, the way he is a master at taking the question and answering exactly which party wants. And then if you try and follow up, he's like, excuse me, ex you know, like yeah. it, it, he knows. <laughs> and then whenever you're talking, it's not that he's annoyed about getting interrupted. If he realizes he's been mirandering and then you interrupt him, all good. But if he's striving home a point, which he has to make sure appears in your transcript mm -hmm. or whatever, it's, it's like, it really was fascinating for me to look at. And what was also crazy with Trump is I realized how much he was living in the moment. So like when I went to the Oval, you know, I've read all these biographies and like I walk in, I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm in the Oval Office. Well, like, you interviewed him in the Oval Office. In the Oval, every time was in the Oval Office. You scared shitless? Sorry. To well, I wasn't scared. I was just, look, it's the Oval Office, right? I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm this nerd he was like this kid i when i'm so i will admit this here like i printed out on my dad's label maker when i was like seven and i wrote like the oval office on my bedroom so i was like you know a huge nerd yeah. like obviously egomaniacal even from seven <laughs> but so like for this i mean it was huge right i'm like this 25 year old kid and like i walk in there and like i see the couch right and yeah. i'm like oh man like that's a kissinger like, you know, and I'm like, that's where like Kissinger and Nixon got on their knees. And you see over by the door and you're like, are the scuff marks still there from when Eisenhower used to play golf? You know, this is all running through my mind. Yeah. With Trump, none of it was there. Yeah. None of it, right? So like- it's all in the even, moment. Even the desk, like, I put my phone on the desk to record. Yeah. And I'm like, this is the fucking resolute <laughs> desk. I'm like, I shouldn't put my phone on this thing, right? Yeah. And, and I'm like, HMS Resolute, you know, all yeah. that, you know, national. And even for him, he doesn't think about any of it. It was like amazing to me. Like he had this portrait of Andrew Jackson right next to his, to the, uh, I think from on the fireplace, like right here on the right. And the most revealing question was when I was like, Mr. President, what are people going to remember you for in a hundred years? And he was like, he he had he was like, I don't know, like veterans choice. He, he like has a list in front of him yeah. of like his accomplishments, which is staff. Question, by the way, yeah. Well, I I mean that's what I wanted to know. Yeah. And he's like veterans choice, and I remember looking at him being like, I I don't want to like go into too much of it or yeah. whatever, but like he uh. I mean, he is so mindful of when that camera is on mm -hmm. and when the mic is hot in terms of the language that he uses, what he's willing to admit, what he's willing to talk about, how he's willing to even appear in front of his staff. Um, I think the most revealing thing Trump ever did was there was this press conference like right after he lost the, the uh, right after the midterm elections mm -hmm. in 2018. And one of the journalists was like, Mr. President, thank you for doing this press conference. And he looks at him and he goes, it's called Earn Media. It's worth billions. <laughs> he, just, he just like had so much disdain for him because he's like, I'm not doing this for you. He's like, I'm doing this for me. So he's really aware of the narrative of the story. I mean, that yeah. the people have talked about that all comes from the tabloid media of the from new york and so on he's a master of that but i've also heard stories of just in private he's a really i don't want to overuse the word charismatic but just like he is a really interesting almost like um friendly like a good person 
Like, it, yeah. Yeah, like that's what I heard. Uh, I've heard actually surprising the same thing about yeah. Hillary Clinton. Uh, <laughs> and like <laughs> that, I can't tell you anything about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like the the way they present themselves is perhaps great lighting. Yeah, I was like, I was like, you are your own like lighting yeah. director, yeah. You're the president. Right? It's great. It's, it's so funny. But it's like you said, he's he's very charismatic and friendly. I mean, you wouldn't know. I mean, look, I, this is what I mean in terms of the dyna dynamism of these people that gets lost. And I think even he knows that. Like, I don't think he would want that side of him that I you know, that you see in those off the record moments and more in order to come out because he's very keen about how exactly he presents to the public. It's like, you know, even his presidential portrait, everybody usually smiles and he refused to smile. He was like, I want to look like Winston Churchill. Conversation. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I like that he's humble enough to say like uh, Abraham Lincoln and whatever. Like no, no, no. He says maybe Lincoln. Maybe. Remember that. He maybe. says maybe Lincoln. Uh, <laughs> do you think he actually believes that or is that something he understands will uh, create news and also perhaps more importantly piss off a, a large number of people is is he almost like a musician masterfully playing the emotions of the public or does he or, or and does he believe when he looks in the mirror i'm one of the greatest men in history combination of all three um i do think he believes it and for the reason why is i don't think he knows that much about u.s history i i really mean that like and that's what i meant whenever i was in there and i realized he was just living in the moment i don't think he knew all that much about why i mean this is why he was elected in many ways right so i'm not i'm not saying this is a norbert like a, i'm not making a judgment with on this i'm just saying i do think in his mind he does think he was one of the best presidents in American history, largely because, and I encountered this with a lot of people who work for him, which is that they didn't really know all that much kind of about what came before and all that. And it's not necessarily to hold it against them because for in many ways, that's what they were elected to do um, or elected to be in many ways. It's an interesting question whether right. knowing history, being a student of history is, uh, is productive or counterproductive. I tend to assume... <laughs> country literally or like you know didn't have to stave off that or he didn't buy you know the louisiana purchase like all that. he mm -hmm. literally came into a pretty you know static country and he could have just governed you know with, with i mean he was the person who came before him was assassinated like he easily could have coasted but he literally willed the country into something more and that is that's always why i focus a lot on him too because i'm like that in many ways, I wouldn't say it's easy to be great during crisis. I mean, like, look at Trump, right? Yeah. But like, but there, it can bring out the best within you. Yes. But it's a, it's a whole other level to bring out the best within yourself. Just it does feel that the modern political landscape makes it more difficult to be inspirational in the sense because everything becomes bickering and division. Yes. I do want to ask you, please, uh, about Trump. Uh, so you're now a successful podcaster. <laughs> I've talked to Joe about Trump, uh, Joe Rogan, and he, Joe's not interested in talking to Trump. Mm -hmm. It's just fascinating. I try to dig into like why. Yeah. Uh, what would you interview? Srink in Central Park okay. and got that media attention. That was it. Yeah, he's a fascinating study. I still, I feel uh, there's a hope in me that there would be a podcast like uh, like a Joe Rogan, like a long form podcast where it's something could be, you know, and you're actually a really good person to do that, where you can have a real conversation that looks back at the election and reveal something on us. But perhaps he's thinking about running again, and, and so maybe he'll never let down that guard. Yes. But like, you know, I, I just love it when uh, there's this switch in people where you start 
start looking back at your life and wanting to tell stories mm -hmm. like you know trying to extract wisdom and like realizing you're in this new phase of life where like the battles have all been fought now you're this old like former warrior and now you can tell the stories of that time and it seems like Trump is still at it, like the young warrior he is. He's not in the mode of telling stories. You know what I got from Rogan? He's yeah. the only president who didn't age well in office. <laughs> it's true, right? Yeah. Like, because, and this is what I mean, because he lives in the moment. Like yeah. the job actually aged Obama. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Bush, same thing. Even Clinton. Clinton was like fat. And yeah. like, he looked miserable by like, <laughs> 2000 hw like yeah. i mean reagan famous actually yeah pretty much everybody i think about um yeah including john f kennedy who got much sicker while in office yeah. the job like weighs on you and makes you physically ill trump was he's the only person who just that was he amazing didn't happen to he almost got, gotten stronger and he was uh, one of the most divisive like uh the climate there's so many people attacking him so much yeah. hatred so much love and hatred and it was just he it was i mean it was uh whatever it was it was uh quite masterful and a and a, and a fascinating study i if we um if, if we stick on uh hitler for just a minute uh what lessons do you take from that time do you think it's a unique moment in human history that world war ii i mean both stalin and hitler you know, is is it something that's just uh, an outlier in all of human history in terms of the atrocities, or is there uh, lessons to be learned? You mentioned we mentioned uh, offline that you're not just a student of the entirety of the history, but you also are fascinated by just different like policies and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's the immigration policy? What's the yeah. policy on science? And well, look, uh, Third Reich in Power, let me plug it, by Richard uh, Richard Evans, I think is what it was. Because that actually will tell you, like, what was it like to live under the Nazi regime without the war? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a hard question in terms of the lessons that we can learn because there's a lot and it's actually been over, it's been over indexed almost. I mean, yeah. Everything comes back to Hitler in yeah. a conversation. So I kind of think of it within Mao, Stalin and Hitler as, I don't want to say payments for, but like the end point payment for the sins and the problems of the monarchical system that evolved within Europe, basically like 1400 mm -hmm. and more. But I think of it as, I like to think about systems, especially here in DC, that's where I got into politics. Yeah. Okay, so like these are, <laughs> these are like books I base my life on. And look, these are Washington and the story of the post New Deal era and forward. Not much has changed. Like the Senate is the still the Senate. So many of the same problems with the Senate are still there. Um, in some cases, no, not not anymore. But for a while, some of the people who were there with Johnson are actually <laughs> still. Um, one of them is the president of the United States. Just a joke. And you think about also same with the media relationship, right? Like there's this media really they may have come and gone like the the people who were in the media and who were cozy with the administration officials. I mean, they just recreated themselves. It's like this. It's like an ecosystem which doesn't change. And the, the that's why I'm like, oh, it's not that was a specific time. That's just D.C. Like that is dc because of the way the system is architected it's pretty much been that way since like 1908 whenever like you know teddy roosevelt was dining with these journalists and he would yell at them and then he would go over to the society house and like in many ways that's now instead of going to henry adams's house like the people are co congregating in Specific outcomes that can only be changed in extraordinary times. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's hard to to predict what kind of outcomes will result from the incentive, uh, the system that you create, right? Right. In the case, because especially when it's novel kind of situations, what Trump actually created a pretty novel situation, 
and a lot of the uh, things that we've seen in the 20th century were very novel systems where people were very optimistic about the the, the outcomes, right? And then it turned out to not have the results that uh, they predicted. I, in terms of like things being unchanged for the past hundred years and so on, can you um, like Wikipedia style or maybe like in, in a musical form, like I'm only a bill, describe to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I still sing that to my head sometimes. <laughs> I'm just a bill. <laughs> uh, I don't know what the rest of the song goes, but yeah. let's let's uh, let's leave that to people's imagination. Uh, how how does this whole thing work? How does the U.S. political system work? The three branches is how do you think about the system we have now? If you mm -hmm. were to, to try to describe, if aliens showed up and asked you like people who make our laws then we pick the guy who executes those laws and they together pick the people who determine whether they or the president is breaking the law at the most basic level that's right. how i would describe it right? so the so that's the people who make the laws are Congress. Mm -hmm. The executive is is charged with executing the laws as passed by Congress, the system, the branches of government, and the Supreme Court is picked by the president, confirmed by the Senate, which then decides whether you or other people are breaking the law in terms of interpretation of that law. That's basically it. Oh, and they they decide whether those laws are in they fall within the they fall within the restrictions and the want of the founders as expressed by the constitution of the united states which is a set of principles that we came together in 1787 i want to make sure i get this right <laughs> um 1787 and decided that we were going to live the rest of our lives barring a revolution and more. And we've made it 200 and something years in order on under that system. So there's a balance of power that's because you have multiple branches, there's a tension and a balance to it as designed by those original documents. Uh, what, which is the most dysfunctional of the branches? Which is your favorite? Like uh, in terms of talking about systems and like mm -hmm. what's the greatest of concern and what is the greatest source of benefit in, well, in your view? The presidency, well, the presidency is my favorite to study, obviously, because it is the one where there's most subject to variable change in terms of the personality involved. <laughs> reading about the senate and histories of the senate is you're like oh yeah there were always like assholes in the senate who were doing their thing and and you know filibustering constantly based upon this or that and then the person the personalities involved with the senate haven't mattered as much since like pre-civil war right like pre-civil war you had like henry clay and then daniel webster and john c calhoun who even in their own way they represented like larger constituencies and they crafted these like compromises up until the outbreak of the civil war etc but like post since then you don't think about like the titans within the senate mm -hmm. most of that is because a lot of the stuff that they had power over has transferred over to the executive so I'm most interested in really in like power, like where it lies. It's actually pretty, you know, throughout American history, much more used to lie with Congress. Now it's obviously just so imbued within the executive that understanding executive power is, I think, the thing I'm probably most interested in here. Do you think at this point the amount of power that the president has is corrupting to the to their ability to lead well? <laughs> announce it he'll be like and we're getting out of syria it's great and then the generals freak out they're like whoa 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 we don't have a plan for that he's like but you guys told me six months he's like i don't know now we need another six months in order to figure this thing out yeah. so that's how and by that time now you're midterms so now what yeah. now you gotta run for re-election so more what i mean by that is if you don't have a hyper intentional view about how to change foreign policy if you don't have a hyper intentional view about how the department of commerce should do its job 
They are just going to go on autopilot. So there's this is part of the problem. When you ask me about the presidency, it's not the presidency itself, like the president himself, which has become too powerful. It's that we have less democratic checks on the people and the systems that are on autopilot. And I would say that basically since 2008, we have voted every single time to disrupt that system, except in the case of 2020 with Joe Biden. And there are a lot of different reasons around why that happened. Mm -hmm. And in every single one of those cases, Obama and Trump, they all failed in order to in order to radically disrupt that. And that just shows you how titanic the task is. And I'm using my language precisely because I don't want to be like deep state and all, but like obviously there's a deep state. Deep state, I guess, has conspiratorial exactly. uh, the, the tinges to it. But so you're, what you're saying is the true power currently lies with the autopilot, yeah. aka deep state. <laughs> well, but see, it's not, this is the thing too I want to make in, in clear because I think people think conspiratorially that they're all coming together to intentionally do yes. something. No, 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 yeah. no. They are doing what they know believe they are right and don't have real democratic checks within that. And so now they have entire generations. <laughs> Colonel, um, the president of the United States makes American foreign policy. Yeah. But it was a very revealing comment because he and met all the people within national security bureaucracy do think that they're like this is the yeah. policy of the United States. It's we we have to do this. That's where things get screwy. Well, listen for me personally, yeah. but also from an engineering perspective, I just talked to Jim Keller. It's just this is the kind of bullshit that we all hate in uh, when you're trying to innovate and design new like products. Right. So like that's the that's what first principles thinking requires is like we don't give a shit what was done before. The point is, what is the best way to do it? And it seems like uh, the current government, government in general, probably bureaucracies in general, are just really good at being lazy about never having those conversations. Mm -hmm. And just, it becomes this momentum thing that nobody has the difficult conversations. It's be become a game within a certain set of constraints. And they never kind of do revolutionary tasks. But you did say that the presidency is power, mm -hmm. but you. Is that it's not just that you have to get it done, you have to pick the 100 people who you can trust to pick 10 people each to actually do what you want. One of the most revealing quotes. It's from a guy named Tommy Corcoran. He was the top aide to FDR. This I'm getting from the Kara books too. And he said, what is a government? It's not just one guy or even 10 guys. Hell, it's a thousand guys. Yeah. And what FDR did is he masterfully picked the right people to execute his will through the federal agencies. Johnson it was the same way. He played these people like a fiddle. He knew exactly who to pick. He knew the system and more. Part of the reason that outsiders who don't have a lot of experience in Washington almost always fail is they don't know who to pick. Or they pick people who say one thing to their face. And then when it comes time to carry out the president's policy in terms of the government, they just don't do it. And the president's too. Uh, think about this. I think some Rahm Emanuel said this. He was like, by the time it gets to the president's desk, nobody else can solve it. It's not easy. It's not like a yes or a no question. It's every single thing that hits the president's desk is incredibly hard to do. And Obama actually even said, and this was a very revealing quote about how the, how he thinks about the presidency, which is he's like, look, the presidency is like one of those super tankers. You know, he's like, I can come in and I can make it two degrees left and two degrees right. In a hundred years, two degrees left, that's a whole different trajectory. Yeah. Same thing on the right. And he's like, that. Oh. 
run the government and just recreate. Like, why are you hiring Larry Summers, who is one of the people who worked at all these banks and didn't believe the bailouts were going to be big enough, and then to come in in the worst economic crisis in modern American history? Yeah. That was 2008. And Summers actively lobbied against larger bailouts, which had huge implications for working class people and pretty much hollowed out America since. Okay, from Trump, same thing. You're like, I'm going to drain the swamp. And by doing that, I'm going to hire <laughs> Goldman Sachs's Gary Cohn yeah. and Steve Mnuchin and all these other absolute Bush of money within our politics. What we're really pissed off about is we're like, our politics only seems to work for the people who have money. I think that's largely true. Um, I think that the reason why things worked differently in the past is because economic distribution and cultural problems, too, at the same time. I don't want to erase that because I actually think that's what's driving all of our politics right now. So that's interesting. So see, yeah. it was one. So in that sense, representative yeah. government is doing a pretty good job of representing yeah, it is. The, the state of culture and the people yeah. and so on. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you, uh, in terms of um, you know the deep state and conspiracy mm -hmm. theories, there's a lot of talk about, so f again, from an outsider's perspective, if I were just looking at Twitter, it seems that at least 90% of people in government are pedophiles. <laughs> that 90, 90 to 95%, I'm not sure what that number is. Yeah. <laughs> if I were to just look at Twitter. No, listen, it's like the pedophile thing. Like, right. I, I don't know how many people are complete sex addicts, but like it seems like we're like looking out into the world, like there's a well, like the Me Too movement have revealed that there's a lot of like weird, yeah, like uh creepy people out there. I don't know, but I think it was just one of the many tools that he used uh to uh convince people and manipulate people, but not in some like um evil way but more just really good at the art of conversation yeah and just winning people over on the side and then by building through that process building a network of other really powerful people and not explicitly but implicitly having done shady shit with powerful people yeah like building up a kind of implied power of like, like we did some shady shit together. So we're not like, you're going to help me out on this extra thing I need to right. do now. And that builds and builds and builds to where you're able to actually control, like have quite a lot of power without explicitly having like a strategy meeting. And I think a single person or, yeah, I think a single person can do that, or can start that ball rolling. And over time, it becomes a group thing. Like, I don't know if uh, Jillian Maxwell was involved or others. And or, yeah, over time, it becomes almost like a really powerful organization that wasn't, that's not a front for something much deeper and bigger but it's almost like maybe it's because I love cellular automata, man. <laughs> a system that starts out as a simple thing with simple rules can create incredible complexity. Yes. And so I just think that uh, we're now looking in retrospect, it looks like an incredibly complex system that's operating. And but like that's just because it's, you know, there could have been a lot of other Jeffrey Epstein's in, in my perspective that the simple thing just. Uh, was successful early on and builds and builds and builds and builds. And then there's uh, creepy shit that, like a lot of aspects of the system helped it get bigger and bigger and more powerful and so on. So the final result is, I mean, listen, I, I have a pretty optimistic, I have a, I tend to see the good in people. And so it's been heartbreaking to me in general just to see, you know, people I look up to not have the level of integrity I thought they would, or like the strength of character, mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. And it seems like you should be able to to see the bullshit that is Jeffrey Epstein, like when you meet him. Right. 
Uh, we're not talking about like Eric Weinstein, like one or two or three or five interactions, but like there's people that had like <laughs> like years of relationship with him. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Even what... after he was. Okay. Here's the open question I have. I don't know how many creepy sexual people there are out there. He did that for some of the weirdest, most brilliant people. I don't want to sort of drop names, but everybody knows them. It's like people that are the most interesting academics is the one he cared about. Yeah. Like people are thinking about the most difficult questions of in all of science and all of engineering. So those people are were kind of outcasts in academia a little bit because they're doing the weird shit. They were the weirdos. <laughs> and he cared about the weirdos and he gave them money. And that, uh, you know, I, that's, I don't know if there's something more nefarious than that. Uh, I I hope not, but maybe I'm surprised. And in fact, uh, half the population of the world is pedophiles. No, I, I think it's what you were talking about, which is that... You know, like, I don't want to, I don't know, I almost lost my temper, you know, one time whenever a car hit me and I'm like, I can't freak out in public anymore. Like yeah. that, you know, like what if somebody takes a photo or something? Yeah. And so I think that there's an extent to that times a billion, mm -hmm. literally, when you have a billion dollars or more and you take that all together and you stack it up on itself. I saw a story about like Bill Clinton, like Bill Clinton was with Epstein or with Ghislaine Maxwell in a private air terminal or something. And she had one of their like sex, you know, one of those girls who was underage, had her dressed up in a literal like pilot uniform. And she was underage in order to, you know, and she was dis being disguised for being older. And she was a masseuse, right? Because that was one of the uh, guises which they got in order to sexually traffic these women. And she was like, Bill was like complaining about his neck. And she's like, give Bill Clinton a, ma a massage, right? So now there's a photo of an underage girl giving a massage to the former president of the United States. I don't think he knew, right? But like, that looks bad. And so I, th this is kind of what we're getting at, which is that you're setting it all up and creating those preconditions. You're a fucking prince. You should probably know better. Yeah. But- I don't think he knew she was underage, or maybe he did. And if he did, then he's even more of a piece of shit than I thought. But if we, when we, when we look at these things, the the stuff I'm more interested in is like what you were talking about. I'm like Bill Gates. How do you get the richest man of the world in your house? Yeah. Like under what? God? And Gates is like he was talking about financing and all this. I'm like, you don't have access to money or bankers. Like you're the richest man in the world. Like yeah. you can call Goldman Sachs anytime you want on a hotline. Like why do you need that's where I, that's where I start again to get more conspiratorial because I'm like Bill dude, you can you have the gold credit, right? <laughs> like you don't need Epstein to create some yeah. complicated financing structure or Leon Black. Like what what is 2015, 2009, I mean, this is very recent stuff. Or, and this is the part that really got me, is I read the department, I think it's called the Department of Financial Services report around Deutsche Bank with Epstein. They knew he was a criminal. They solicited his business, explicitly knew that his business meant access to other high net worth individuals, Just consistently doled money out from his account for hush payments to women in Europe and prostitution rings. They knew all of this within the bank. It was elevated multiple times. What was the problem? Because that that's probably why I hesitate to touch conspiracy theories is because I'm allergic to certainty in yes. all forms, in politics, any kind of discourse. And people are so sure it, in both directions, actually. It's, it's kind of hilarious. Uh, Either they're sure that the conspiracy theory, a particular whatever the conspiracy theory is, is false. Like they almost dismiss it. Like, uh, like they, they don't even want to talk about. It. It's like the people, like the way they dismiss that the Earth is flat. Yes, most scientists are like they don't even want to like hear what the 
what the flat earthers are saying. <laughs> they don't have a, like zero patience for it, which is like maybe in that case, yeah, is deserved. But everything else, you really like have empathy. Like consider the you have okay. This is weird to say, but I feel like you have to consider that the earth might be flat for like one minute. Like well, you have to be empathetic. You have to be open-minded. I don't see a lot of that through our cultural tastemakers and more. And that's that really is what concerns me the most because it's just another manifestation of all of our problems is that we have this completely bifurcating economy, bifurcating culture, literally in terms of we have the middle of the country and then we have the coast and in terms of the population it's almost 50-50 and with you know increasing mega cities and urban culture like urban monoculture of LA, New York and Chicago and DC and Boston and Austin relative to how an entire other group of Americans live their lives or even the people within them who aren't rich and upwardly mobile, how they live their lives is just completely separating. And all of our language and communication in ma mass media and more is to the top, and then everybody else is forgotten. Do you think when you go, when you dig to the core, there is a big, there's a big gap between left and right? Is there, is that division that that's perceived currently real? Or are most people like center left and center right? It's so interesting because that's such a loaded term, center left. What does that mean? Like to you, I think the way you're thinking of it is I'm not like a, well, even this, like I'm not a radical socialist, but I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm marginally left on cultural issues and economic issues. This is how we've traditionally understood things. Yeah. Um, and then when when in popular discourse, like center right, like what does it mean to be center right? Like I am marginally right on social on conserv on social issues and marginally right on economic issues. Yeah. But that's just not politics. Like if you look at survey data, for example, like uh stimulus checks, people who are against stimulus checks are conservative, right? Well, eighty percent of the population is for a stimulus check. So that means a sizable a number of Republicans are for stimulus checks. Same thing happens on like a wealth tax. Um, the same thing happens on, okay, Florida voted for Trump 3.1%, more than Barack Obama 2008. On the same day, passes a $15 minimum wage at 67%. Yeah. So what's going on? So that's why- What I, is going on? Well, that's you know, what my so, entire career. So, <laughs> like, no, but but it seems yeah. like uh, so th that's yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah. The conversation is different than the policies. Well, it's different than reality. That's what right. I would say. Which is that the way we have to understand American politics today. It didn't always used to be this way. Is it's almost entirely along basic. I, I would say the main divider is. Because even when you talk about class, this misses it in terms of socioeconomics. It's around culture, which is that it's basically if you went to a four year degree grant. I'm one of the people, chief among them, I will own up to it here. I was totally wrong about why Trump was elected in 2016. I believed, and I based a lot of my public commentary belief on this. Trump was elected because of a rejection of Hillary Clinton neoliberalism on the back of a pro-worker message, which was anti-immigration. It was its pillar, but alongside of it was a rejection of free trade with China and <laughs> generally of the political correctness and globalism, which has been come in through the uniparty and same thing here with the military industrial complex and endless war. He rejected all of that. What's, wait, what's wrong with that prediction? It's wrong, man. And the reason I know this sounds is right. that <laughs> it sounds right. I wish it, I honestly wish it was true, but here's the truth. Trump actually governed largely as a neoliberal Republican who was meaner online 
and who departed from orthodoxy in some very important ways. Don't get me wrong. I will always support the trade war with China. I will always support not expanding the wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq. I will support him moving the Overton window on a million different things and revealing once and for all that GOP voters don't care about economic orthodoxy necessarily. But here's what they do care about. Trump got more votes in 2020 than he did in 2016, despite not delivering largely, largely for all the Trump people out there on that agenda. He wasn't more pro-union, but he won more union votes. He wasn't necessarily more pro-worker, but he actually won more votes in Ohio than he did in 2016. And he won more Hispanic votes than despite being, you know, all the immigration agenda, uh, rhetoric, et cetera. Here's why. It's about the culture, which is that the culture war is so hot that negative partisanship is at such high levels. All of the vote is geared upon what the other guy might do in office. And there's a poll actually just came out by Echelon Insights. Crystal and I were talking about it on Rising. The number one concern amongst Democratic voters is Trump voters. Number one concern. Mm. Not issues not, like Trump voters. And number two is white supremacy. And so like, which is basically code for Trump voters. And is the same then, true for the other side? Well, so on the right, number one concern is illegal immigration. Um, oh. And number, I think, three or four or whatever is Antifa, which is code for That's nice. Democrats. At least on the right, it's a policy kind well, of thing. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Ben, I saw Ben Shapiro is talking about this. But the reason why I would functionally say it's the same is because the, I mean, you can believe whether this is true or not. I think it actually largely is true. But like the a lot of GOP vo voters feel like a lot of illegal immigration is code for like people who are coming in who are going to be legalized and are going to go vote Democrat. Like I can I can just explain it from their point of view. So like, what does that actually mean? Each other, like yeah. and each other, which is that the number one concern is the other person. So negative partisanship has never been higher, and. I think people who had my thesis in terms of why Trump was elected in 2016, you have to grapple with this. Like, how did he win 10 million more votes? He came 44,000 votes away from winning the presidency across three states. Like, I don't, none of our popular discourse reflects that very stark reality. And I think so much of it is people really hate liberals. Like, they just really hate them. And I was driving through rural Nevada before the election. And I was like literally in the middle of nowhere. And there was this massive sign this guy had out in front of his house. And it just said, Trump, colon, fuck your feelings. And I was like, that's it. That is why people voted for Trump. I, and I don't want to denigrate it because they truly feel they have no cultural power. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I just don't, they've become swears, essentially. Uh, is that, I mean, how do we get uh, out of this? Because that, uh, that's why I just don't even say anything about politics online, because it's like, really? Like, you, you can't, you, if, well, here's what happens. Anything you say that's, like, thoughtful, like, Hmm, I wonder the like, uh, immigration, something. Right. Like, so I wonder, like, why, you know, uh, we have these many, we allow these many immigrants in, or the, some version of the, like, thinking through these difficult policies and so on. The, they immediately try to find, like, a single word in something you say that can put you in a bin of liberal or white supremacist. And then hammer you to death <laughs> by saying you're one of the two. And then everybody just piles on happily that we finally nailed this white supremacist or liberal. And that is this some kind of weird like feature of online communication that we've just stumbled upon? Is there a way or is it possible to argue that this is like a feature, not a bug? Like this is a, a good thing? <laughs> yeah, well. Look, I just think it's a reflection of who we are. People like to blame social media. I think we're just incredibly divided right now. I think we've been divided like this for the last 20 years. And I think that the reason I focus 
almost 99% of my public commentary on economics is because you asked an important question at the top, how do we fix this? Yeah. Well, what did I say about the stimulus checks? Stimulus checks have 80% approval rating. So that's the type of thing, if I was Joe Biden and I wanted to actually heal this country, that's the very first thing I would have done when I came into office. Same thing on uh, when you look at anything that's going to increase wages. Um, I, I said on the show, I was like, look, I think Joe Biden will have an 80% approval rating if he does two things. If he gives every American a $2,000 stimulus check and gives everybody who wants a vaccine a vaccine. That's it. It's pretty simple. Because here's the thing. I don't really like Greg Abbott that much. We have like very different politics. I'm from Texas, but my parents got vaccinated really quickly. That means something to me. I'm like, listen, I don't really care about a lot of the other stuff. He got my family vaccinated like that. Well, I will forever remember that. And that's how we will remember the checks. This is a part of the reason why Trump almost won the election and why if the Republicans had been smart enough to give him a 2000, another round of checks, 100% would have won, which is that people were like, look, I don't really like Trump, but I got a check with his name on it. And that meant something to me and my family. I'm not saying for all the libertarians out there that you should go and like endlessly spend money and buy votes. Mm -hmm. What I am saying is lean into But I'll tell you what I would have done if I was him. I would have come in and I would have said there's five United States senators who are on the record, Republicans, who said they'll vote for a $2,000 check. And I would put that on the floor of the United States Senate on my you know first or so, the first day possible. Mm -hmm. And I would have passed it and I would have forced those Republican senators to live up to that, vote for this bill, mm -hmm. come to the Oval Office for a signing so that the very first thing of my presidency was to say, I'm giving you all this relief check. This night long national nightmare is over. Take this money. Do with it what you need. We've all suffered together. The thing about Biden is he has a portrait of FDR in his in the Oval, which kind of bothers me because he thinks of himself as an FDR like figure. Mm -hmm. But this is you have to understand the majesty of FDR. We're talking about a person who passed a piece of legislation five days after he became president, and he passed 15 transformative pieces of legislation in the first 100 days. We're on day like 34, 35, and nothing has passed. The reconciliation bill will eventually become law, but it will become law with no Republican votes. And again, that's fine, If but it's not fulfilling that legacy and the urgency of the action. And the mandate, which I believe that history has handed it handed it to Trump and he fucked it up, right? He totally screwed it up. He could have remade America and made us into the greatest country ever coming out on the other side of this. He decided not to do that. I think Biden was again handed that. Yeah. It's like the obvious <laughs> thing to do is like, yeah. what's the popular thing? Like 80% of Americans support this. Like do that clean. Uh, also do it like with like grace where you're able to bring people together not like in a political way but yeah. like obvious like obvious common sense way like uh just people the republicans and democrats just bring them together on a policy and like bold just hammer it mm -hmm. without the dirt without the mess whatever try to compromise just the yell with have a good Twitter account, like loud, very clear. We're going to give a $2,000 stimulus check. Anyone who wants a vaccine gets a vaccine at scale. What make America, let's make America. Because of coalitional politics and they owe something to somebody else. For example, Biden has got a lot of the Democratic constituency he has to satisfy within this bill. So there's going to be a lot of shit that goes in there, state and local aid, um, all this stuff. Again, I'm not even saying this is bad, but he's like, his theory is, and this isn't wrong, is like, 
we're going to take the really popular stuff and use it as cover for the more downwardly less popular. And so the Dems could face the accusation. The people who are on this side, this is their pushback to me. They're like, why would we give away the most popular thing in the bill? And then we would never be able to pass state and local aid, yeah. right? Why would we do that? And the Republicans do the same thing, right? Like Mitch McConnell, because he's a fucking idiot, decided to say, we're going to pair these. Gaslit into our culture war framework of politics. And the reason it feels so broken and awful is because it is. But there is a way out. It's just that nobody wants to be – it's a game of chicken, right? Because maybe it is true. Maybe we would never be able to get your other Democratic priorities or your Republican priorities. But I think that the country understands that this is fucking terrible mm -hmm. and would be willing to support somebody who does it differently. There's just a lot of disincentives to not stay without – there's a lot of incentives to not stray from the traditional path. Yeah. Is it also possible that – the A students are not participating. Like we drove all of the the superstars away from politics. So like you just had this argument before. I mean, everything you're saying sort of uh, rings true. Like this is the obvious thing to do. As a student of history, you can almost like tell like, if you look at great people in history, this is what great leaders in history, this is what they did. It's like uh, clean, bold action. Uh, sometimes facing crisis, but we're facing a crisis. No, right we're now. in a crisis. We've exactly. been, <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> so why don't we, uh, uh, why don't we see those leaders step up? That's, I mean, you say that's kind of like, it, it makes sense. There's a lot of different interests at play. Mm -hmm. You don't want to risk too many things, so on and so forth. But that's what, like, that sounds like the C students. <laughs> I don't think it's that. I think it's that the pipeline of politician creation is just totally broken from beginning that's to it. end. So it's not that A students don't want to be uh, politicians. It's basically the way that our current primary system is constructed is what is the greatest threat to you as a member of Congress? It's not losing your reelection. It's losing your primary, right? So that means, especially in a safe district, you're most concerned about being hit if you're a Republican from the right. Same way, where you're like, there is something going on here, which is just... Like I've been to an Obama rally, I've been to a Clinton rally, I've been to um, several normal poll. Yeah, it's fine, you know. Yeah. With Trump and with Yang, it was it's another world. Yeah, it's another yeah. world. Yang, Yang. Yeah. There's there's, a, there's probably thousands of people listening right now. We're just like doing a <laughs> yeah slow clap. <laughs> Yes, I know, I know. Uh, Yang Gang, yeah. uh, forever. Okay, but uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, my worst fear. I I prefer Yang, uh, uh, Andrew Yang, kind of free, uh, improvisational idea exchange, all that versus AOC, who I think, no matter what she stands for, is. Uh, a drama machine creates dramas just like Trump does. I would say my worst fear would be in 2024, is AOC old enough? It'd be AOC versus Trump. I don't think she's old enough. I think you'd have to be, I don't know. I think she's 30. So she needs five more years. So probably not. Yeah. Okay. But that kind of, yeah. that that's, or Trump Jr. Well, AOC probably wouldn't win a Democratic primary. So, I mean, look, Joe Biden is, you know. So they that's pretty what, much showed that. that yeah. That's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. This process grooms you over time. It's you see the same thing in academia, actually, which is very interesting. Is the the process of getting tenure? There's this. It's like you're being taught without explicitly being taught. Yes. To behave in the way that everybody's behaved before. I've heard this, it was funny, I've had a few conversations that um, were deeply disappointing, which <laughs> which are which involved statements like, This is what's good for your career. Yes. 
this kind of conversation, almost like mentor to mentee conversation, or it's, you know, it's like, there's a grooming process in the same way, I guess you're saying the primary process mm -hmm. does the same kind of thing. So, I mean, that's what people have talked about with Andrew Yang. It was, uh, it was, he was being suppressed by a bunch of different forces, the mainstream media and all, just the democratic, just that whole process didn't, didn't like the, the honesty that he was showing, right? For now, but here's my question to you. People got to see, look, Jordan Peterson is one of the most famous people in America, right? Like you have a massive podcast. You're more famous than half the 99% of the people at MIT. So like from that perspective, everything has changed. And somewhere out there, there is a student who's taking notice. Yeah. And I've noticed that with my own career, everybody thought I was crazy for doing this show with Crystal, the Hill. They thought it was nuts. They're like, what are you doing? You're a White House correspondent. You've got a job forever. The other job offer I had was being a White House correspondent. And people thought I was nuts for not just sticking there and, you know, aging out within Washington, pining for uh, appearances on Fox News and CNN and MSNBC. But I hated it. I just hated doing it. And I did not want to be a company man, like a Washington man, who's one of those guys who, like, brags to his friends about how many times he's been on Fox. <laughs> at a total split point. And look, there will always be a path for people. Cause like, I don't want people to overlearn this lesson. I have people who are like, I'm not gonna go to college. And I'm like, well, just wait. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm like, just- <laughs> I'm starting a podcast. Yeah, yeah like stop, man. just like, <laughs> yeah. just w hold on a second. But there will always be a path for the institutional. There will, that will always be there for you. But now there's something else. Now there's another game in town. And that's more appealing to millions and millions and millions and millions of people who feel unserved by the corporate media, CNN, and these people, possibly who feel unserved um, in the, you know, the faculty. Like, yeah. if you are an up-and-comer who wants to teach as many young people as possible, I think you should be on YouTube, yeah. right? Like, look at the Khan Academy guy. That guy created a huge business. So I just think... We can be cynical and like upset about what that system is, but we should also have hope. Like I have a lot of hope for what can be in the future. Yeah, there's a, there's a guy people should check out. So my, my story is a little bit different because I basically uh, stepped aside for, for, with the dream of being an entrepreneur earlier in the pipeline than like a like a legitimate like senior faculty would. There's an example somebody people should check out, Andrew Huberman from Stanford, who's a neuroscientist, who's as world class as it gets in terms of like tenure faculty, just a really world class researcher. And now he's doing YouTube. And yeah, do, I see him be, on Instagram. Yeah. And he's right. great. So he switched. So he not just yeah. does Instagram, he now has a podcast. And he's doing, he's changing the nature of like, I believe that Andrew might be the future of Stanford. And for a lot, it's funny, like he's basically, Joe Rogan is an inspiration to Andrew mm -hmm. and, and to me as well. And so those ripple effects and Andrew is an inspiration probably just like you're saying to these young, like 25 year olds who are soon to become faculty, if we're just talking about academia, and the same is probably happening with with government. Is funny enough, Trump probably is inspiring a huge number of people who are saying, "Wait a minute, I don't have to play by the rules." Exactly. And uh, I have to, I can think outside the box here. And you're right. And the institutions we're seeing are just probably lagging behind. So the optimistic view is the future. <laughs> Uh, is going to be full of exciting new ideas. So Andrew Yang is just kind of the beginning of this. He's whole tip thing. of the iceberg, yeah. and I and I hope that iceberg doesn't. It's not this influencer. One of the things that really <laughs> bothers me. Yeah, I've gotten a chance <laughs> that want to win the game of politics. They already As, are, man. Yeah. And and like we mentioned, AOC. Mm -hmm. It's I hope they optimize for the 80% populist thing, right? <laughs> like they optimize for that badass thing that history will remember you as the great man or woman that did this thing versus 
how do I maximize engagement today and keep growing those numbers? The the influencers are so, I'm so allergic to this, man. Mm -hmm. They keep saying how many... That's a big jump. That may be like thinking in this way, like, I wonder what I did. I'll do that again. In this way, one, it's uh it creates anxiety and almost psychological effects, whatever. The the more important thing is it prevents you from truly thinking boldly in the long arc of history, in uh creatively, yes. thinking outside the box, doing huge actions. 100%. And I actually up my optimism is in the sense that that kind of action will beat out all the influencers. Well, I don't know, Lex. <laughs> this is where my cynicism comes in. So there's a guy, Madison Cawthorn, the youngest member of Congress. Um, and he, I, I don't want to say got caught, but there was like an email where he was like, my staff is only oriented around comms. Like he was basically saying, he got basically caught oh, saying no. like, my staff, is only centered on communications. And that's the right play. If you do want to get the benefits of our current electoral, political, and engagement system, which is that, what's the best way to be known within the right as a, as a right-wing politician? It's to be a culture warrior, go on Ben Shapiro's podcast, be one of the people on Fox News, go on Sean Hannity's show, go on Tucker's show, and all of that, because you become a mini celebrity within that world. Left unsaid is that that world is increasingly shrinking portion of the American population, and they barely, they can't even win a popular vote election. Um, let alone barely win and eke out an electoral college victory in 2016. Well, but the incentives are all aligned within that. And it's the same thing really on the left. But you're right, which is that ultimate, and look, th this, is, this is why geniuses are geniuses, because they buck the short-term incentives. They focus on the long-term. They bet big, and they usually fail. But then when they get big, they they. Uh, succeed spectacularly. Yeah. The people I know who have done this the best are like a lot of the crypto folks that I've spoken to. Like some of the stuff they say, I'm like, I don't know if that's going to happen. But look, they're like billionaires, right? Yeah. You know? so, <laughs> yeah. And you're like, so they were right. So it's it, uh, uh, the way I've heard it expressed is you can be wrong a lot, but when you're right, you get right big. Yeah. And I mean, I've seen this in Elon Musk's career. I mean, he took spectacular risk, like spectacular risk and just doubled down, doubled down, doubled down, doubled down, doubled down. And you can kind of tell to him, I mean, you know him better than I do, but like from my observation, I don't think the money matters no. as, right? I just, I, like when I see him, I'm like, I don't, it's, nobody works as hard as you do and builds the way that you build if it's just about the money. It just it just doesn't happen. Like nobody wills SpaceX into existence just for the money. Like it's not worth it, frankly, right? Like he probably destroyed years of his life and like mental sanity. Money or attention or fame, none of that. Yeah. That's, that's not the primary priority. Well, that's what's so appealing to me, to me in particular, about him, just like and how he built. Like I read a biography of him and just like the way that he constructed his life and like is able to hyper focus in meeting after meeting and drill down and also hire all of the right people who execute each one of his tasks discreetly to his perfection is amazing. Like that's actually the mark of a good leader. But I mean, if you think about his career. <laughs> at post impeachment vote as he was after November. Now look, yeah, again, surveys, bullshit, et cetera. But like, that's all the data we have. That's what I can point to. If Trump runs, he will be the nominee and he will be he will be the 2024 nominee. I just don't know if he wants to. It it, it really depends. Like do you, do you think he wins after the Trump vaccine heals all of us? Do you think Trump wins? It depends on how popular culture functions over the next 4 years. And I can tell you that they are cuz I don't think Biden has that much to do with it because again, <laughs> Trump is not a manifestation of an affirmative policy action. Yeah. It is a defensive bulwark wall against cultural liberalism uh, at its best. So it's like, this is why it doesn't matter what Biden does. If there are more 
whoever wins the GOP primary, in my opinion, will be the person most hated by the left. One of the people, things that people forget is, you know who came in second to Trump? Ted Cruz. And the reason why is because Ted Cruz was the second most hated guy by liberals in America, a second to Trump. They have nothing in policy in common. But don't you yeah. think this kind of brilliantly yeah. described system of hate being the 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 main mechanism yeah. of, of our <laughs> electoral choices? Yeah. Don't you think that just has to do with mediocre candidates? Like it like it's, it's basically the field of candidates including trump including everybody w was just like didn't make anyone feel great right it's like really this is what we have to choose from maybe a mark cuban or like uh mark cuban as a democrat or it would have to be somebody like that somebody who because here's the thing about trump it's not just that it was trump he was so fucking famous. Like people don't yeah. realize he was so famous. Like I, I even when I first met Trump, I met a couple of other presidents. But when I met Trump, even I felt like kind of starstruck because I was like, yo, this is the guy from The Apprentice. Yeah. I'm like, this is the dude. Like <laughs> from The Apprentice. Yeah. Because like, I'm like, my dad and I used to sit and watch The Apprentice when I was in high school. And then one of the guys was from College Station where I grew up and we're like, oh my God, like that guy's on The Apprentice. Like it was a phenomenon. There's mm -hmm. like that level. It's kind of like when I met Joe Rogan, I'm like, holy shit, that's yeah. Joe Rogan. That's <laughs> I don't feel that way when I meet Mitt Romney or Tom Cotton or Josh Hall. And I met all of them. Um, but there's I'm a like, lot of celebrities, right? Do you think there's some celebrities we're not even thinking about that could step <laughs> If the rock necessarily has like the formed policy agenda because then here's the other problem what what if we set ourselves up for a system where like these people keep winning but like with trump they have no idea how to run a government yeah. it's actually really hard right and you have to have the know-how and the trust to find the right people this is this is where the genius element comes in is you have to understand that front and you have to understand how to execute discrete tasks like this is the FDR. This is why it's so hard. Like FDR, Lincoln, TR. They were who they were and they live in history and their name rings like for a reason. And yeah, I mean, one of the most depressing lessons I got from 2020 is at almost, it seems like in my opinion, that we over learn the lesson of our success and not of our failures. For example, like we have this narrative in our head that we always have the right person at the right time during crisis. And in some cases, it was true. We didn't deserve Lincoln. We didn't deserve FDR. We didn't deserve, um, we didn't deserve a lot of presidents at times of crisis. But then you're like, okay, George W. Bush, 9-11, that was terrible. Um, Reconstruction, Andrew Johnson, awful, right? Like we had several periods in our history where the crisis was there, they, they're, they were called and they did not show up. And I really, it hadn't happened in my lifetime except for 9-11. And even then you could kind of see that as an opportunity for somebody like Obama to come in and fix it. But then he didn't do it. And then Trump didn't do it. And you realize, I feel like our politics are most analogous to like the 19... Tens, like all in terms of the Gilded Age, in terms of that. Remember those that long period of presidents between, um, between like Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt. We were like, wait, like who was president? Like, mm -hmm. or or even in even TR was like an exception where you have like Calvin Coolidge, who yeah. like Silent Cal. So we're living through Grover that. Cleveland. I, that's kind of how. I, if I think of us within history, I feel like we're in one of those times we're just waiting it feels really yeah. important to us right now like right. this is the most important moment exactly. in history but it might be the, it could just the, be a blip right a 20 yeah. 30 year blip like when you think about who was president between 1890 and 19 before i mean yeah between like 1888 and 1910 like nobody really thinks about that period of america but like that was an entire lifetime for people right like what did they how did they feel about the country that they were in. That's hilarious. That's how I kind of think about it's, where we it's are. It's funny right to now. think. I mean, I don't yeah. want to minimize it, right. but like we haven't really gone through uh, a World War II style crisis. So, like, 
say that there is a crisis in like several decades of that level, right? Existential risks mm -hmm. to a large portion of the world. Then what will be remembered is World War II, maybe a little bit about Vietnam, and then whatever that crisis is. And this whole period that we see as dramatic, even coronavirus. Even 9-11. Even 9-11. It's like, because you can look at how many people died and all those kinds of things, all the drama around the war on terror. And all. I think this era, it's not necessarily Elon and SpaceX, but this era will be remembered by the new, the like of the space exploration, of uh, the commercial, of companies getting into space exploration, of space travel and perhaps perhaps like artificial intelligence around social media all those kinds mm -hmm. of things this might be remembered for that but every all the political bickering all that nonsense that might we might might be very well forgotten one way to think about it is that the internet is so young yeah i think about That's it right. <laughs> um with so jeff jarvis he's a media scholar i respect he's not the only person to say this but many others have which is <laughs> And I've always been like, this isn't history. This is some like stupid fucking bill, you know, whatever. But like, that was the first time I was like, this is history. Like this yeah. right here. Well, I was hoping, yeah. uh, tragedy aside, that this, I wish the primaries happened during coronavirus so that we, <laughs> right. because like, then we can see the, so, okay, here's a bunch of people facing crisis. <laughs> of tests, uh, all, all kinds of infrastructure building that you could have done in 2020. There's so many possibilities for just like bold action. It makes and, me sad. Uh, none of that, even just forget actually doing the action, advocating for it. <laughs> yeah, right. Just saying like this, we need, we need to do this. And none of that, like the speeches that Biden made I don't even remember a single speech that Biden made because there's zero bold. I mean, their strategy was to be quiet and let Donald Trump uh, polarize the electorate, po po yeah. polarize the electorate, and hope that results in in uh, them winning uh, because of the high unemployment numbers and all those kinds of things, as opposed to like, let's go big, let's go with a big speech. That's you know that. Ah, uh, yeah, it's a lost a lost opportunity in some sense. So we talked a bunch about politics, but mm -hmm. one of the other interesting things is that you're involved with is uh, uh, or involved with defining the future of is journalism. I suppose you can think of podcasts as a kind of journalism, of and, it but is. but also just writing in general, and just whatever the hell the future of this thing looks like uh, is up to be defined by people like you. So what? do you think is broken about journalism and what do you think is the future of journalism i think the future of journalism looks much more like what we you and i are doing here right now and journalism is going to be downstream from a culture that can be a good and a bad thing depending on how you look at it we are going to look at our media our media is going to look much more like it did pre-mass media and the way that i mean that is that Back in the eighteen um, in the eighteen hundreds, in particular, especially after the invention of the telegraph, when information itself was known. So, for example, like you and I don't need to. Com Let's say you and I are competing journalists. You and I are no longer competing, quote unquote, to tell the public X event happened. All journalism today is largely explaining. <laughs> find out about hard events like the president has departed the white house but not only right? that i don't yeah. know about you but for i also looked at twitter to the exact thing you're saying which yeah. is the response to the news Correct. like the thoughtful sounds ridiculous but you yeah. can be pretty thoughtful in a single well, tweet if you file if you follow the right people yeah you can get that and so that is the future of media which is that the future of media is it will be much smaller amount or much larger amounts of people which are famous to smaller groups. 
So Walter Cronkite's never going to happen again, at least in our, in probably within our lifetimes, where everybody in America know who this guy is. That that age is over. I think that's a good thing because now people are going to get the news from the people that they trust. Yes, some of it will be opinionated. I'm in my my program. I'm well, Crystal and I are like we are a, this. She's coming from this like view. I'm coming from this view. That's our bias when we talk about information, and we're going to talk about the information that we think is important, mm-hmm. and it has garnered a large audience. I think that's very much where the future is going to be. And the reason why I think that's a good thing is because people will be engaged more within it rather than the current system where news is highly concentrated, highly consolidated, has groupthink, has the same uh, elite production pipeline problem of everybody knows journalists all come from the same socioeconomic background and they all party together here in DC or in New York or in LA or wherever and they're part of the same monoculture and that affects what they uh, that affects what they report this will cause a total dispersion of all of that the the a the battle of our age really well in and then this more consolidated one which holds cultural power and elite power and more importantly money right Mm -hmm. over you and i that's the battle that we're all going to do you think unfettered conversations have a chance to win this battle yes i do in the long run in the long run the internet is simply too powerful but here's the mistake everybody makes the new york times will never lose it will just become one of us see you think so they already are they are the largest daily the daily look at the daily not even that think about it not in podcasting the times is not a mass media product it is a subscription product for upper middle class largely white liberals mm. who live the same circumstances across the united states and in europe there's nothing wrong with that but here's the thing you can't be the paper of record when you're actually the paper of upper middle class white america I think it as a brand it is it does have the level of credibility assigned to it still you know there's politicization of, of it totally but it there's a credibility like it has much more credibility than i forgive me than i think you and i have no, no you're right in, yeah. in in terms of uh your podcast like people are not going to be like uh <laughs> they're yeah. going to cite the New York Times versus right. what you said on the podcast sure. for uh, for an opinion. I, the, I wonder, in the sense of battles, whether unfettered conversations, whether Joe Rogan, whether your podcast can become the have the same level of legitimacy, or the the flip side, New York Times loses enough legitimacy to be at the same level of. Uh, in terms of how we talk about it. It's gonna long, it's a long battle, right? It's gonna take a long time. And I'm saying this is where I think the end state is going. <music> Amongst these people, because they're like, oh my God, I love Michael. Like I love the way he does this stuff. Again, that's fine. More people are listening to the news. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. And then who else do they hire? Ezra Klein from Vox. Yeah. A Kara Swisher also from Vox, who does Pivot, which is an amazing podcast. Um, or uh, like Jane what? Coasted, same thing. It's yeah. personalities who are becoming bundled together within this brand, right? But here's, yeah. okay, maybe yeah. I'm just a hater. Because <laughs> I loved podcasting from the beginning. I loved Green Day before they were cool, man. <laughs> but I am bothered by it. Like, why doesn't, Kara Swisher, she's done successfully. I think on her own. No, she was always a part of some kind of institution. I'm not sure, but she the, started her own thing. I think it would recode, anyway, right? Yeah, the, right. recode. Yeah. I don't know if that's her own thing. Right. Yeah, yeah. So she she was very successful there. Why the hell did she join the New York Times with the new podcast? Why is Michael Barbaro not do his own thing? Because he gets paid, and because he has, he wants the elite cachet that you just referenced within his social circle in New York, which is that I think the biggest mistake that some of the venture people make is if we give everybody the tools that those people are all going to leave to like go Substack and go independent, 
within their social circle, sacrificing some money from being independent is worth it to be a part of the New York Times. That's sad to me because it propagates old thinking, like, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it propagates old institutions. And you could say that New York Times is going to evolve quickly and so on, but I would love it if there was a mechanism for reestablishing, like for building new New York Times mm -hmm. in terms of public legitimacy. And I suppose that's uh, wishful thinking because it takes time to build trust in institutions and it takes time to build new institutions. My main thing I would say is public legitimacy as a concept is not going to be there in mass media anymore because of the balkanization of audiences. I mean, think about it, right? Like, um, this is like Legion, you know, the classic stuff around a thousand true fans or, or, or no, sorry, like a hundred true fans even now. Like you can make a living on the internet just talking to a hundred people. Yeah. If as long as they're all high frequency traders, some yeah. of the highest people, highest paid people on Substack, they don't have that many subs. It's just that they're Wall Street guys, right? Mm -hmm. So people pay a lot of money. Again, that's great. So what you will have is an increasing balkanization of the internet. Um, of audiences and of niches, people will become increasingly famous within us. You will become astoundingly famous. I'm sure you've noticed this with your fan base. Mm -hmm. I certainly have with mine. Like 99% of the people have no idea who I am. But when somebody meet, they're like, oh my God, I watch your show every day, right? Like it's the only thing I watch yeah. for news, right? Like <laughs> instead of casually famous, if that makes sense, be like, oh yeah, that's like Alec Baldwin. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Oh shit, that's Alec Baldwin. But you're not like, oh shit, I love you, Alec Baldwin. Yeah. It's this is a Ben Smith of the of, of the New York Times. Actually, he wrote this column. He's like, the future is everybody will be famous, but only to a small group of people. Yeah. And I think that is true. But again, I don't decry it. I think it's great because yeah. I think that the more that that happens, the more engaged people will be, and it empowers different voices to be able to come in and then possibly, I wouldn't say destroy, but compete against. I mean, look at Joe. Joe is more powerful than CNN and MSNBC and Fox all put together. That gives me like immense inspiration. Yeah, Like he created the space for me to succeed. And I told him that when I met him, I was like, dude, like I listened to his podcast when I was like young and like, and I remember like when I got to meet him and all that, and I told him this on this pod, I was like, I didn't know people were millions were willing to listen to a guy talk about chimps for three straight hours, yeah. including me. I didn't know that I'd yeah. be one of those people. Yeah, me too. I learned right. something about myself for yes. the show, yeah. And so by creating that space, I'd be like, wait, there's a hunger here. Like he showed yeah. us all the way. And none of us will ever again be as famous as Rogan because he was the first and that's fine because he created the umbrella ecosystem for us all to thrive. Yeah. That is where I see like a great amount of hope within that story. Yeah, and the cool thing he yeah. also supports that ecosystem. He's such a he's so it, so generous. One of the things he paved the way on for me yeah. is to 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 show that you can just be honest, publicly honest, yes, and uh, not jealous of other people's success, but instead of be supportive and and all, all those kinds of things, just like loving towards others. He's been an inspiration. I mean, uh, to the comics community, I think there are a bunch of, uh, before that, I think there were all a bunch of competitive haters they towards were. each other. Yeah, and now he's like, just injected love, Yeah, you know? They're like, they're still, like many are still resistant, but they're like, they a guy or like a radio catcher records this and posts it online. American Airlines confirms that this is authentic audio. And they go, all further questions should be referred to the FBI. So then, okay, American Airlines just confirmed this is a legitimate transmission. FBI, then the FAA comes out and says, we were tracking no objects in the vicinity of this plane at the time of the transmission. So the only plausible explanation that online sleuths have been able to say is maybe he saw a Learjet, which was, you know, using like open source data, FAA rules that out. So what was it? He saw a large cylindrical object. While he was mid-flight, American Airlines, you can go 
online, listen to the audio yourself. This is a 100% no shit transmission confirmed by American Airlines of a commercial pilot over New Mexico seeing a quote unquote large cylindrical object in the air. Like I said, um, when we first started talking, I've never believed in, I've never believed. Being overly cautious about the re release information. I'm sure there's a lot of information that would inspire the public, that it would inspire trust in institutions that will not damage national security. Like, it seems to me obvious. And the reason they're not sharing it is because of this momentum of bureaucracy of mm -hmm. caution and so on. But there's probably so much cool information that the government has. The way I almost, I wouldn't say it confirmed it's real, but Trump didn't, didn't declassify it. Like, you know that if there was ever a president that actually wanted to get to the bottom of it, it was him. Yeah. I mean, he didn't declassify it, man. And it, people begged him to. I know for a fact, because I pushed to try and make this happen, that some people did speak to him about it. And he was like, no, I'm not going to do it. So he might be afraid. Uh, that's what I mean, though. He's a yeah. they were probably all telling him, they're like, sir, you can't do this, you know, all this, like, wow. Well, and, and I get that. And there's this legislation written in COVID that, like, they have six months to release. Yeah. I mean, is that real? What is that? Is that a bunch I think of bullshit? It's bullshit. I think it's bullshit. There's so many different levels of classification that people need to understand. I mean, look, I read John Podesta. He was the uh, chief of staff to Bill Clinton. He's a big UFO guy. He He tried. Like him and Clinton tried yeah. to get some of this information and they could not get any of it. And we're talking about the president and the White House chief of staff. Well, there's a whole bureaucracy built, just like you were saying, yeah. with intent. You have yes. to be like, that has to be your focus because there's a whole bureaucracy built around secrecy for probably for a good reason. So to get through to the information, there's a whole like paperwork process, all that kind of stuff. You can't just walk in and get the, unless, Again, with intention, that becomes your thing. Like, exactly. let's revolutionize this thing, yeah. and then you get only so many things. Uh, it's it's sad that the the bureaucracy has, has gotten so bulky. Um, but I think the hopeful message is from earlier in our conversation. It seems like a single person can't fix it, but if you hire the right team, it feels like you can. You can't fix everything. I don't want to. I don't want to give people unrealistic expectations. You can fix a lot, especially in crisis. You can remake America. Yeah. And the reason I know that is because it's already happened twice. FDR, or in modern history, FDR and JFK. But, uh, sorry, FDR and JFK's assassination, LBJ. Two hyper-competent men who understood government, who understood personnel, and coincidentally were friends. <laughs> New Deal, the consolidation then, or the using the levers of power like Johnson knew in order to change the House of Representatives, the Senate of the United States, and ultimately the presidency of the United States, which ended in failure and disaster with Vietnam. Don't get me wrong, but he's overlooked for so many of the incredible things that he did with civil rights. Nobody else could have done it. No, no one else could have gotten it done. And the second thing is, we got to get you into World War One. We got to get you more into World War One because I think that's a rabbit hole. Which I know you're a Dan Carlin fan, mm -hmm. so Blueprint for Armageddon, yeah, it's keep, good, guaranteed. But but there's it, fewer evil people there. Yes, but well, but th that's what actually there's a banality of that evil mm -hmm. of the Kaiser and of the uh, Austro-Hungarians and of see, I like World War One more. Because it was unresolved. It's one of those periods I was talking to you about, about like sometimes you're called and you fail. Like that's what happened. I mean, 50 million people were killed in the most horrific way. Like people literally drowned in the mud, like like an entire generation. Uh, I, one stat I love is that, you know, Britain didn't need a draft till 1916. Like they went two years of throwing people into barbed wire voluntarily. Yeah. And because people loved their country and they loved the king and they thought they were going against the Kaiser, it's just like that conflict to me, I just can't read enough about it. Also just like births, Russian revolution, you know. Yeah, I mean. Hitler. You like, can't talk about like, World War II without World War One, Right. Right. 
and I'm obsessed with the conflict. I've read way too many books about it for this reason is it's unresolved. And like the the roots of so much of even our current problems are happened in Versailles, right? Like Vietnam is because of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, many ways, the Middle Eastern problems and the division of the states there, the uh, Treaty of Versailles in terms of the penalties against Germany, but also the uh, fallout from those wars on the French and the German population, or the French and the British populations and their reluctance for war in 1939 or 1938 when, when Neville Chamberlain goes, right? Like that's one of the things people don't understand is the actual appetite of the British public mm -hmm. at that time. They didn't want to go to war. Only Churchill. He was the only one in the, you know, in the gathering storm, right? Like being like, hey, this is really bad. that contributed to the proliferation of Hitler and more. So like, I'm obsessed with World War I for this reason, which is that it's just like the root, oh, it's like the culmination of the monarchies, then the fall, mm -hmm. and then just all the shit spills out so, from there for like a hundred years. So World War yeah. I is like the most important shift in human history. Versus I would, like, I would World War II is like a consequence of that. Yeah, it's it's so I have a degree in security studies from Georgetown. And one of the thing is that we would focus a lot on that is like war and but also like the complexity around war. And it's funny, we never spent that much time on World War II because hmm. it was actually quite of a clean war. It's a very atypical war, as in the war object, which we learned from World War One, is we must inflict suffering on the German people and invade the borders of Germany and destroy Hitler. Like the center of gravity is the Nazi regime and Hitler. So it had a very basic begin and end. Begin, liberate France, invade Germany, destroy Hitler, reoccupy, rebuild. World War I, what are you fighting for? <laughs> like, are you, I mean, and nobody even knew. You, you can yeah. go, the German general staff, they were like, even in 1917, they're like, the war was worth it because now we have Luxembourg. I'm like, really? Like you killed 2 million of your citizens for fucking Luxembourg and like half of Belgium, which is now like a pond. Yeah. And same thing, the French are like, well, we're, well the French more so they're defending their borders. But like, what are the British fighting for? Why did hundreds of thousands of British people die? In order to preserve the balance of power in Europe and prevent the Kaiser from having a port on the English Channel? Like really, that's why? These, that's more what wars are, is they become these like yeah. atypical, set, uh, they, they become these protracted conflicts with a necessary diplomatic re resolution. It's not clean, mm -hmm. it's very dirty. It usually leads in the outbreak of another war and another war and another war and a slow burn of ethnic conflict, which bubbles up. So that's why I look at that one. Even because it's it's more typical of warfare, in yeah. Terms the, of how it works exactly. Yeah. It, it's it's kind of interesting. You're making me realize yeah. uh, that uh, World War II is one of the rare wars where you can make a strong case for it's a fight of good versus two. Right, because there's a pressure. That guy has his demons. I, lo <laughs> I love that so much. He's so this is the the. I don't know if you feel this pressure. Yeah. But as a creative, he feels the pressure of being maybe not necessarily correct, but maybe correct in the in the sense that his understanding he gets to the bottom of uh, of why something happened, of what really happened. Yeah, get get to the bottom of it before he can say something publicly about mm -hmm. it. And he is uh, tortured by that burden. I know. It, you know, he takes so much shit from the historical community for no reason. I think he's the greatest popularizer, quote unquote, of history. And I wish more people in history understood it that way. He was an inspiration to me. I mean, I do some videos sometimes on my Instagram now where I'll like, I'll do like a book tour. I'll be like, here's my bookshelf of these presidents. And like, here's what I learned from this book and this book and this. And that was very much like a a skill I learned from him of being like, as you know, as the historian writes. You know, you know, I love I just love the way he talks. He's like, in the mud. <laughs> or you know, he'll be like, quote. Unquote. Yeah. <laughs> I just I love he he inspires me, man. Yeah. He really does to like learn more and 
I've read, I bought a lot of books because of Dan Carlin. He'll be, you know, because of this guy, because of that guy. Um, in terms of, you know, another thing he does, which nobody else, and I'm probably guilty of this, he focuses on the actual people involved. Like he would tell the story of actual British soldiers ha- yes. in World War One, mm-hmm. and I probably, and maybe you're guilty of this too. We overfocus on what was happening in the German general staff, what yes. was happening in the British general staff, and he yes. doesn't make that mistake. That's why he tells real history. Yeah, and and make, it gives it a feeling. The result. Is- and that was hard, man. Like. I feel more politically homeless right now than I ever have, but I have realized in the last couple of months, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. It's freedom. It's It's more just like, I no longer feel as if I even have the illusion of a stake within the game. I'm Mm -hmm. like, I only look at myself as an outside observer and I will only call it as I see it truly. And I, I was aspiring to that before, but I I had to have, in a way, Trump stopped the steel thing. It like took my shackles off 100%. Yeah. Because I was like, no, this is bullshit. And I'm going to say it's bullshit. Yeah. And I think it's bad. And I think it's bad for the Republican Party. And if people in the Republican Party don't agree with me on that, that's fine. I'm just not going to be necessarily like associated with you anymore this is probably one of the first political related politics related (laughs) conversations we've had uh i mean unless you count michael malice who he was great (laughs) thing which is uh like anarchist um handbook or something like that yeah it's like anarchy for idiots or something (laughs) like that which uh i Last think is really need, but... <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> well me yeah. being an idiot right. and being curious about anarchy is, right. seems useful so i like those kinds of books that's russian heritage man yeah they're anarchist 101 yeah i i yeah. mean it's a uh i find those kinds of things a uh, useful thought experiment because uh that's why i, I it didn't it's, it's first thing and the reason I like that is because it comes back to a point I made earlier. It's all about intentionality, which is that you actually can will something into existence, yes. even if people don't want it. That was the craziest thing. Like they, nobody wanted this, yeah. but it still ruled for half a century or more. Actually, I mean, almost you know, That's seventy-five years. To think that yeah. it, there could have been a history of uh, the Soviet Union that was dramatically different than uh, Leninism, Stalinism, that was completely different, like almost would be the American story. Yeah, it, it, oh, easily. I mean, there's a world where, and I don't have all the characters, there's like Kerensky, and then there was like uh, whoever Lenin's number two, Stalin's chief rival, and even, I mean, look, even a Soviet Union led by Trotsky, that's a whole other world, yeah. right? Like literally a whole other world. And- yeah, it's just, I don't know. I find it so interesting. I will never not be fascinated by Russia. I uh, always will. It's funny that I get to talk to you because it's like, I read this book. I forget what it's called. It won, I think it won a Pulitzer Prize. And it was like the story of, I tried to understand Russia post Crimea because I I came up amongst people who are much more like neoconservative and they're like, fuck Russia, you know, Russia is bad. Buy it. And I was like, okay, like what do these people think? Mm-hmm. And We have this narrative of like the fall of the Soviet Union. And then I read this book from the perspective of Russians who lived through the fall. And they were like, this is, I was like, this is terrible. Like, actually, the introduction of capitalism was awful. Mm -hmm. And all like the rise of all these crazy oligarchs. That's why Putin was came to power to to like restore, um, restore order to the oligarchy. And he still talks to this day. Do you guys, I mean, that's always yeah. the threat <laughs> yeah. of like, do you want to return to the nineties? Right. Do you want to return to the Yeltsin? Hel- and, yeah. And, and like, but the thing is in the West, we have this, like our own propaganda of like, no, Yeltsin was great. That was the golden age. What could have been with right. Russia? And I was like, well, what do actual Russians think? And so that, yeah, I, I, I'll always be fascinated by it. And then just 
like to understand the idea of feeling encircled by NATO and all of that, you have to understand like Russian defense theory all the way going back to the czars has always been defense in depth in terms of having Estonia, Lithuania and more is like protection of the heartland. I'm not justifying in this. So NATO shills like, please don't come after me. But and I'm, look, Estonian, Estonians like NATO. They want to be in NATO. So I don't want to minimize that. I'm more just saying, like, I understand him and Russia much better having done that. And we are very incapable in America. I think this is probably because my parents are immigrants. and I've traveled a lot of just putting yourself in the mind of people who aren't Western and haven't lived a history, especially our lives, of America's fucking awesome. We're the number one country in the world. Like, yeah. I'm like, we're literally better than you, like in many ways. Yeah. And they, they, they can't empathize with people who have suffered so much. Yeah. And I just, yeah, it's just so interesting to me. What about if we could talk for just yeah. a brief moment about the human of Putin and power? You are clearly fascinated by power. Mm-hmm. Do you think power changed Putin? Do you think power changes leaders? If you look at the great leaders in history, whether it's LBJ, FDR, mm -hmm. do you think power really changes people? Like, is there a truth to that kind of old proverb? It reveals. I think that's what it is. It reveals. So Putin was a much more deft politician, much more amenable to the West. If you think back, you know, to 2001 and more, right when he came, because he was still, because at that time, his biggest problem was intra-Russian politics, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was all consolidating power within the oligarchy. Once he did that by around like 2007, there's that famous time when he spoke out against the West at the Munich Security Conference. I forget when it was. Mm -hmm. And that's when everybody in the audience was like, whoa. And he was talking about like NATO encirclement and like we will not be beaten back by the West. Very shortly afterwards, like the Georgia invasion happens. And that was like a big wake up call of like we will not be pushed around anymore. I mean, he said before publicly, like the worst thing that ever happened was the fall. Or what did he say? It was like the fall of the Soviet Union was a tragedy, right? Yeah. Of course, people in the West were like, what? I'm like, I get it, right? Like they were a superpower. Now they're population is declining like it's like a petro state it sucks like i understand um i understand like how somebody could feel about that i think it revealed his character um which is that he i think he thinks of himself probably as he always has since 2001 as like this benevolent almost as a benevolent dictator. He's like, without me, the whole system would collapse. I'm the only guy who's keeping these people in, I'm the only guy keeping all these people in check. Most Russians probably do support Putin mm -hmm. because they feel like they support some form of functional government and they Stability, view it as yeah. like a check yeah. against that, which is a long, you know, has a long history within Russia too. So I don't know if it changed him. I think it just revealed him. Um, because it's not like he, I mean, he has a bill, you know, Navalny has put that like billion dollar palace and all that. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like Putin does that for show. He doesn't seem like somebody who indulges in all that stuff. Or no. maybe we just don't see it. Like, I don't know. Well, I don't, yeah. I, I, it's very difficult for me to understand. I've been hanging yeah. out, thanks to Clubhouse. <laughs> uh, a lot of, I've gotten to learn a lot about the Navalny folks and it's been very educational made me ask a lot of important questions about what, um, you know, question a lot of my assumptions about what I do and don't. Press. But I think there is a legitimate support and love of Putin in Russia that is not grounded in just misinformation and uh, propaganda. There's, there's legitimacy there. Mostly I tried to remain apolitical and actually genuinely remain up apolitical i am legitimately not interested in the politics of russia of today i feel i have some responsibility and i'll take it uh, that responsibility on as i need to but my fascination as it is perhaps with you in part is in the historical figure of putin mm -hmm. i know he's currently president 
but I'm almost looking like as if yeah. I was a kid in 30 years from now reading about him, studying the the human being, the the games of power that are played that got him to gain power, to maintain power, what that says about his human nature, the the nature of the bureaucracy that's around him, the nature of Russia, the people, all those kinds of things, as opposed to the politics and the manipulation and the corruption and the control of the media that results in misinformation. You know, those are those are the bickering of the day, just like we're saying, mm-hmm. what will actually be remembered about this moment in history. Totally. He's a transformational figure in Russian history, really, like the bridge between the fall of the Soviet Union and the chaos of Yeltsin. That will be how he's remembered. The only question is what comes next and what he wants to come next. That's I'm always fat. I'm like, he's getting up. How old is he? 60 something? Yeah, 60. So he would be, I think he would be 80. So with with the change of the uh, constitution, he cannot be president until uh, uh, 2034, I think it is. Uh So he would be like 80 something and he'll be in power for over 30 years, which is longer than Stalin. The only one who could do it. Stalin, I do think, just wanted power and realized, well, I don't know. Look, he wrote very passionately when he was young. Um, he was, he you know, really believed in communism. In the beginning, he did. I, I, I'm always, what I'm always fascinated is I'm like, around 1920, what happened, right? Post-revolution, you crush the whites, now it's all about consolidation. That's where the games really begin. Yeah. Um, and then I'm like, I don't think that was about communism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Maybe it became a useful propaganda tool, but it still seemed like he believed in it. Uh, whether it was, of course, this is the question. I mean, I, this is the problem with, with uh, conspiracy theories for me. And this is legitimate criticism towards me about conspiracy theories, which is. Uh, you know, just because you're not like this doesn't mean others aren't like this. So like, mm-hmm. I can't believe that somebody be like deeply two-faced. Oh, I've met them. You're welcome to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I think that I would be able to detect. I like, don't think so. no. Those people are good, man. Well, people this, are my question is- I've can, seen it. I mean, you know, Well, so there's yeah. difference, there's, there's two-faced like, uh, uh, there's different levels of two face. Like yeah. what I mean is to be. I don't see that that scale. Uh, like there's a lot of people like that, and I don't. I have trouble imagining. Um, some you know that's such a compelling narrative that people like to say, like people. <sighs> That's the conspiratorial mindset. I think that skepticism is really powerful and important to have because it's true. A lot of powerful people abuse their power. But saying that about, I feel like people over assume that. It's like I see that with uh, use of steroids often in sports. Yeah. People seem to make that claim about like everybody who's successful. Right. And I want to be very, I don't know, something about me wants to be cautious because. Uh, I want to give people a chance. Being purely cynical isn't helpful. People say right. this about me. He's only saying this to do this. Yeah. But at the same time, being naively yeah. optimistic about everything is also uh, counterproductive exactly. because keep, you know, people are going to fuck you over. And more importantly, that doesn't bother me. More importantly, you're not going to be able to reason about how to create systems that are going to be robust to corruption to uh, explore in a lot of depth, the kind of books that you're interested in. I think you mentioned in your show mm-hmm. that you uh, you provide recommendations. Yes, I do. In the form of spoken word, mm-hmm. can you, beyond what we've already recommended, mention books, whether it is historical, uh, nonfiction, or whether it's more like philosophical or even fiction that had a big impact on your life. Is there, is there a few that you can mention? Sure. I already talked about the Johnson book, so I'll leave that alone. Robert A. Caro, he's still alive, thank God. He's finishing the last book. Uh, I hope he makes it. So that those Johnson books. Second- hey, Can I ask you a yeah. question about those books? Yes. 
what the hell do you fit into so many pages? Everything, man. <laughs> Let me tell you this. So I'll just give it an anecdote. This is why I love these books. The beginning, the first book yeah. is about Lyndon Johnson. Yes. His life to when he f- gets elected to Congress. The book begins with a history of Texas and its weather patterns and then of his great, great grandfather moving to Texas. Yes. Then the story of that. About a hundred or so pages in, you get to Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> yeah, so that's how that's how you do it. Okay. Which is you so it's get like a Tolstoy style uh, it's, retelling. This is the thing: it's not a biography; it's a story of the times. That's what great biography. So another one. This isn't part of my list, so don't. Okay. Uh, uh, is <laughs> right. Grant off the record? Ron Chernow. Ron Chernow's Grant. It's a thousand pages, and the reason I tell everybody to read it is, it's not just the story of Grant. It is the story of pre-Civil War America, the Mexican-American War, the Civil War, and Reconstruction, all told in the life of one person who was involved in all three. Mm. Most people don't know anything about the Mexican-American War. It's fascinating. Most people don't know anything about Reconstruction. Now, more so, because people are talking, it's a hot topic now. I've been... Dead. And then before that, how do you survive for a year on the ice? Yeah. On seals. And before that, he kept his crew from depression, frozen one year in the ice. It's inc- just an amazing story. And it, it made me obsessed with Antarctic exploration. So I've read like 15 books on. What the hell is it about the human spirit? That it's amazing. That's, that. that's the thing about Antarctica is it brings it out of you. you. So for example, I read another one recently called Mawson's Will. Douglas Mawson. He was an Australian. He was on the or one of the first shackled or uh, Frost Robert Frost expeditions. He leads an expedition down to the south. Him and uh, a partner. They're leading uh, explorations. 1908, something like that. Yes. They're going around Antarctica um, with dog teams. And one of the what happens is they keep going over these snow bridges where there's a crevice, but it's covered in snow. Mm-hmm. And so. The one of the the lead driver, the dogs go over and they plummet, and that sled takes with it. So the guy survives, but that sled takes all their food, half the dogs, their stove, the the camping tent, the tent specifically designed for the snow, mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. And they're hundreds of miles away from base camp. He and this guy have to make it back there in time before the ship comes to come get them on an agreed upon date and he makes it but the guy he was with he dies and it's a crazy story they they have first of all they have to eat the dogs the a really creepy part of antarctic exploration is everyone ends up eating dogs at different points yeah um and part of the theory which is so crazy is that the guy he was with was dying because they were eating dog liver and dog liver has a lot of vitamin E, which if you eat too much of it can give you like a poisoning. And so uh, Mawson, by trying to help his friend, was giving him more of liver. Of all the things yes, that kills you. I know, is dog liver. Uh, and so his friend ends up dying, have a horrific heart attack, all of that. Mawson crawls back hundreds of miles away, makes it back to base camp hours after the ship leaves. And two guys... Or a couple of guys stayed behind for him, and he basically has to recuperate for like six months before he can even walk again. But it's like you were saying about the human spirit. It's like Antarctica brings that out of people. Or Amundsen, the guy who made it to the South Pole, Robert Amundsen, oh my God. Like this guy trained his whole life in the ice from Norway to make it to the South Pole. And he beat Robert Frost, the the British guy with all this money and all these. I, I could go on this forever. I'm I'm obsessed with it. Well, well first of all, I'm yeah. gonna you know yeah. I'm gonna take this part of the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna set it to music. Yeah, I'm gonna listen to it because I've been whining and bitching about uh, running 48 miles with Goggins this <laughs> next weekend, and this is this yeah. is gonna be so easy. I'm just gonna listen to this over and over in my head. You're you know, gonna be Elon. Elon's obsessed with Shackleton. He talks yes. about him all the time. He yes. uses, the, yeah. I, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. He uses an example of, th- that is a, as an example of what Mars colonization would be like. He's right. 
<laughs> no, that Antarctica is as close yeah. to you can simulate that. Um, the Antarctica is as close to what you could simulate what it would get. That that Nat Geo series on Mars. I'm not sure if you watched it. It's incredible. Elon's actually in it. Um, and it kind of sim- and it's like they get there, everything goes wrong, somebody dies, like it's horrible. It, they can't find any water. It's not working. So what? Like, what is it? Is it like simulating the experience of what it'd be like yeah. to colonize? So it's like a docu series where the fictionalized part is the like astronauts on Mars, but then they're interviewing people like Elon Musk and others who were the ones who like paved the way to get to Mars. Right. So this is a really interesting concept. I think it's on Netflix, and yeah, I agree with him one hundred percent. Which is that. The first guys to make, like, for example, Robert Frost, who uh, uh, went to Australia, well, or, so, sorry, to Antarctica, the British explorer who was beaten to the South Pole three weeks by Robert Amundsen, mm-hmm. he died on the way back. And the reason why is because he wasn't well prepared. He was arrogant. He uh, didn't have the proper amounts of supplies. His team had terrible morale. Antarctica is a brutal place. If you fuck up one time, you die. And it's like you and this is what you read a lot about, which is the reason why such heroic characters like Shackleton shine is a lot of people died. Like there were some people who got frozen in the eye. I mean, man, this again also came to the North exploration. So I read a lot about like the exploration of the North Pole. 20 years and they eventually came across a group of Inuit who were like oh yeah we saw some weird white men here like 15 years ago yeah. and they find their bones and there's like saw marks which show that they were eating each other I so mean, history remembers the ones who didn't eat each other <laughs> yeah we were well yeah we remember the ones who made it but there are uh and that would be the story of Mars as that well that will be the story of Mars so but and nevertheless that's the interesting thing yeah. about uh, Antarctica nevertheless something about human nature drives us to explore it yes that and that seems to be like you know a lot of people have this kind of to me frustrating conversations like well earth is great man why do we need to colonize mars like you just don't get it it's yeah. it i don't know i mean i don't know it's the same people that say like why are you running like why are you running a marathon yeah. <laughs> what are you running from <laughs> man yeah i don't know it's pushing the limits of the uh of the human mind of the of what's possible it's, it's george like, mallory because it's there yeah it's simple like, and that and that somehow actually the result of that if you want to be pragmatic about it there's something about pushing that limit that has side effects that you don't expect that will create a better world back home for the people not necessarily on earth, but like just in general, it raises the quality of life for everybody, even though the initial endeavor doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. The very fact of pushing the limits of what's possible then has side effects of uh, benefiting everybody. And it's difficult to predict ahead of time or what those benefits will be, say with colonizing. like national a quest for national greatness there is no greatness without fulfilling the ultimate calling of the human spirit yeah. which is more it's not enough and why should it be yeah. it wasn't enough you know our ancestors could have been content to sit well actually many of them were were content to sit and say these berries will be here for a long time and they got eaten and they died and it's the ones who got out and went to the next place and the next place and went across the Siberian land bridge and went across more and it just did extraordinary things. The craziest ones, we are their offspring and we fail them if we don't go into space. That's how I would put it. You should run for president. <laughs> no, I'm just pro space, man. I love space. No, you're pro yeah. do, doing yeah. difficult things yeah. and pushing, uh, exploring the world in all of its forms. Right. I hope that kind of spirit permeates politics too. That same kind of uh, can can. I well, it can, and yeah. I hope so. I don't know if you want to stay on it, but sure. I think that was book number one or oh, two. Oh shit! Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, 
is there something? Well, this one is a second. This actually is a corollary to that, which is Sapiens. And I know that's a very normal, normy answer. Yeah. Um, one of the best selling, but I think there's a reason for that. Yeah. You've all know Harari. Oh, cool. Okay, look. Yes, he didn't do any new research. I get that. All he did was aggregate. I'm sure he's very controversial in the scientific community. Yeah. But guess what? He wrote a great book. It's a very easy to read general explanation of the rise of human history. And it helps challenge a lot of preconceptions. Are we special? Are we an accident? Are we more like a parasite? Or are we not? What is there a destiny to all of us? I don't know. You know, if anything, it's like what I just described, which is more move, move out. Um, the evolution of money. Like, I know he gets a lot of hate. But I think that he writes it so clearly and well that for your average person to be able to read that, you will come away with a more clear understanding of the human race than before. And I think that that's why it's worth it. I agree with you 100%. I, uh, I'm ashamed to, I usually don't bring up Sapiens because it's like. Yeah, it's like everybody's <laughs> uncle has read it. But it's, yeah. it's, that's a good thing. It's Actually, one of, yeah. It is one of the, right. I think it'll be remembered as one of the great books of this particular era. Uh, yeah, because it's it's so clearly, it's like the selfish gene with Dawkins. I mean, it mm -hmm. just aggregates so many ideas together and puts language to it that makes it very. This is the Lex Free Podcast.